Yes. Actually, I love 128, but it was just like you would think after living near it for 50 years, you might, you know, you might get used to it. <laughs> oh, golly, huh? So um, this is Bob Begin, um, and I feel like he needs no introduction. Most people here were waiting for him. Um, today he's going to talk about Okinawa, the USS Bunker Hill, Kamikazes, and Sacrifice. Now I want to ask you real quick, since is, is his mic volume good? Can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, and I also want to thank the Friends for funding the <coughs> series. Um, keep it at that. Thank you. So somebody's going to save me a donut, right? Yes. All right. <laughs> and one for my wife, maybe? OK. Uh, <clears throat> I, it's really good to be back in, in, in Beverly. My, my son and his wife live uh, in Wenham, so we come up here a lot. Uh, North Shore has got it all over the Cape. Uh, the Bunker Hill was an aircraft carrier. The Navy would name aircraft carriers after famous battles in, in history. So she was, that's what she was named after. Here's a drawing over. This ship represented the Essex class aircraft carriers. And they were such a step ahead of the rest of the world's navies in terms of capability and aircraft carriers. They, they just changed, they changed the war. She was built in Quincy. She was launched December 8th, 1942, one year and one day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. She, play, she will play a pivotal role in America's long journey across the Pacific to Japan. She's a floating air base, and she can bring her aircraft to a range of 200 miles in Japanese territory. And the aircraft carrier, early in the war, catapulted to the prime, prime weapon. Before that, it was the battleship. But uh, at the beginning of the war, we had eight aircraft carriers. Japan had 10. During the war, we would build 141 more aircraft carriers. Japan would build only 10. If you compared her to uh, a skyscraper, if the Rockefeller Center was lying on her deck, the deck would be 23 feet longer. At the water line, her length was 822 feet. The flight deck, which overhangs a little bit, was 862 feet. She had <coughs> eleva three elevators, one there, and one there, and one there. Right. Uh, yeah, let me use my uh, pointer here. There, there, and there. <coughs> These elevators, they could bring a plane up from the hangar deck in 11 seconds. On the starboard side is the island. 
This is the island, and this is basically the nerve center of the ship. This is where all the decisions are made. This is where the uh, captain, the captain, the captain of the ship is in complete charge of the ship. On the other hand, all of the aircraft and the pilots and the airmen servicing them are in charge of the air officer. There's two separate entities here. So when it comes to anything connecting with the planes, launching, retrieving, whatever, that's the air group's commander, his decision. The air group on the Bunker Hill was Air Group 84. And I'll go into that in a little bit. On the side of the ship, she has, these are all anti-aircraft guns on the side over there. And then you can see there's some here, some here, here, here. But all along, there were individual anti-aircraft guns. Because the biggest threat to an aircraft carrier was an attack by other aircraft. And so what the, what the Navy learned early in the war was more anti-aircraft protection is the way to go. She had two engine rooms, one fore and one aft, and each engine room had two engines in the room. They had four boiler rooms. The four propellers on this ship were driven by four 150,000 horsepower shafts. A lot, of, a lot of muscle, a lot of speed, a lot of capability. Uh, her top speed was 32.7 knots, and she displaced 41,150 tons. This is a huge vessel. Here it is on her launching day. Between the time day she was launched and the commission, there was well over a year because they have to finish off and they have to get all the topside structures done. There's a, uh, a blimp over, over the harbor. This isn't Quincy for aircraft protection. She carries about 104 aircraft. 30 of them are dive bombers, 50 of them are fighters, and 20 of them are torpedo bombers, and there's also four Hellcats that have a special fitting for nighttime flying with radar. So here she is, all of these planes, if you, if you, I don't know how many there are there, but there's four, two deep, three deep, all the way up. That is, they'd come up from the, low, from the hangar deck and uh, they'd be stored all over, all over the plane, uh, the deck. Here's another situation. Sometimes they were using them only to transfer the planes, so the planes would, would be uh, forward. So you have, the flight de you have the flight deck, and that is, uh, it's covered with steel. Let's see. Steel plating one-fifth of an inch thick. So you got this, this steel deck, one-fifth of an inch of steel thick. And then on top of that steel, she had teak planking, wooden planking, and that was four inches thick. So it's got five, just about five inches protection. During the war, as the war went on, they would realize uh, this was not adequate. But if they had put the amount of protection on the, on the uh, flight deck that they really needed, it would have given so much weight to the ship that it would have destroyed a lot of the, uh, a lot of the characters. So you have, I'll go back one minute here. You have the flight deck. Below the flight deck is the hangar deck. And that is, uh, well, these are the aircraft that she's carrying. This is an Avenger. This plane was nicknamed the Beast because it was so rugged. You could have a two-man crew. These are torpedo, 
dive bombers and torpedo planes. It just shows them a very graceful looking flight. Another picture of them, they're returning. Now here's the hangar deck, and the hangar deck is the first deck below the flight deck. It's got a high ceiling, it's got about a 25 foot high ceiling. And you can see there are men over in the, here, they're watching a movie, they're off duty. Over here, these men are loading uh, ordnance, getting ready for, you know, for a plane to uh, be armed. And you can see they're working. So there's always activity going on on the hangar deck. <clears throat> so below the hangar deck, below the flight deck and above the hangar deck is another deck and it's suspended from the ceiling. It's called a gallery deck and the gallery deck was just, it would be suspended from the ceiling maybe 10, 12 feet high. The hangar deck's 25 feet high. But this is where the pilots would be in their ready rooms and the ready rooms were where you go that's the last stop before you, you go, go to your plane. That's where you get your briefing. That's where you get your uh, summary of the, of the flight you've just made. It's, you know, that's the information center. The pilots are as close to their planes as they can possibly be. And when the announcement comes over the PA system, pilots, man your planes, that's it. All they do is they just got to go topside and their planes are there. They had their own seats in the room. They have comfortable lounge chairs. They have a steel box at the bottom of their chair for personal stuff. And their flight gear is hanging from hooks on the, uh, on the wall. I've got a picture somewhere along in here to, to show you. So here, there's one carrier there, one there, and one here. These are the Essex class. These are the big ones. We had a lot of smaller classes. They call them Jeep, Jeep carriers. And they were used for close-up duty. But this is the power punch right here. And you can see the planes are all forward. She's going through the Panama Canal here. They actually had to take a couple of the gun mounts off the uh, starboard side so that they could clear the canal. This is a Corsair. The Corsair was one of the planes that was not normally assigned to, uh, to carriers. It was, it was, they had to get used to it. It had a lot of different flight characteristics. And the first couple planes, the, the first couple Corsairs, when they took off, they would sometimes dip, and if they dipped too low, basically, they'd go into the water and the ship would go right over them. So, so it wasn't the, the main weapon. They were a good fighter plane, but it took a while for them to get acclimated to a uh, carrier. Any aircraft guns? This is a, this is a twin uh, 40 millimeter. In the front here are all these shells. These are all on the side. Here are five inch guns over here, five inch guns. I mean, the entire side of the uh, flight deck is covered with uh, anti aircraft guns. A little bit on the structure here. Commanding officer is George Seitz. The executive officer is Howell Dyson. So these two are the top Navy guys. Admiral Mark Mitch, Mitcher, is the, he's the commander of the whole task force, and he's also the commander of the air group. He oversees the air group. All orders from the staff of Admiral and Mitcher uh, affect the crewmen of the Bunker Hill. The Admiral's staff of 100 officers and men operate from the ship's island. So, I mean, all the communication, all the uh, data analysis, everything, the island, the island is just the brain center of the ship. He had 
different departments. Everybody had, the thing is, this, this ship had a crew of about 30, 3,700 people. Everybody on the ship has a specific job. And I'll just, just rattle off a few of them here. You have the, <clears throat> the men who are in charge of combat information. You have the men operating the elevators, driving jeeps, firefighting, removal of wreckage, men handling the arresting gear. Uh, men loading and rearming the planes. Everybody, I mean, everybody really has a very, very specific role. Don't forget the engine room where my uncle was. <laughs> was he on board the Bunker Hill? No, I think he was on the, uh, might have been on the Chester. Okay, I have, uh, I have engine room comments a little later on. Oh, okay. So, before the attack, a little bit of background information. Japanese military leaders realized the need for a divisive, decisive strike which would neutralize the United States while Japan focused on other targets such as the Philippines, Singapore, Malaya, Wake Island, Hong Kong. In the 20s and then ultimately growing further and further and further was a sense of militarism in Japan. And Japan had a real problem because she would look at her neighbors, if you will, Hong Kong, the Philippines, Singapore, and all of these places had raw material, oil, tin, copper, rubber, and yet Japan had none of them. And all of the places where the raw material was were run by the British and the Dutch and the Americans, and you know, there, there was some resent, re, resentment there. So the, the need for a stronger military was thriving, it was growing in the 20s and the 30s. Admiral Yamamoto, he's the number one chief military brain, if you will, of the Imperial Japanese Navy. He, he was a leading advocate of an attack on Pearl Harbor. He placed great emphasis on the use of carrier-borne aircraft, but he, he strongly cautioned the military people in Japan that Japan would only have about six months before America could gather enough strength and resources to launch a counterattack. December the 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. 353 planes are launched from Japanese carriers. At the end of the day, much of America's Pacific fleet is on fire and lying in the mud. Four of her eight battleships, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arizona, and California, are just on fire and taken completely out. The only good news for America that day was that there were no aircraft carriers in port. They were out on maneuvers. As the planes left, two radio messages were sent. The first was TO, T-O. TO means attack commenced. The second message was RA, R-A, meaning surprise achieved. To the listener, these two messages sounded like Torah, 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 which means tiger. Three days later, Japanese planes attacked and sank two major British warships, Prince of Wales and Repulse. Japanese losses are minimal, while the British losses were severe. In six months, the Philippines, Dutch East Indies, Guam, Malaya and Hong Kong, they all fall to the Japanese. As a result of these early victories, the Japanese face a, a dilemma that they had not anticipated, and that was the amount of prisoners which they now had to deal with. There was no food and there was no provision to treat these prisoners. The fall of Bataan in 1942 resulted in 76,000 Allied prisoners. 
76,000 men that you have to feed or take care of or move. The Bataan Death March showed how brutal the treatment would be because surrendering was not acceptable to the Japanese military. Over 7,000 people died on the Bataan Death March, Americans and Filipinos. The Japanese attitude towards surrender from the Army Code of Conduct Field Service Manual, written in 1941, writes, clearly that being captured would bring shame upon the Japanese army. Never accept alive the shame of capture. Die so as not to leave the disgrace of such an offense. Yamamoto was correct. From the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, the Japanese were unstoppable. In June of 1942, the tide turns. At the Battle of Midway, Japan would lose four aircraft carriers, 3,000 men, and 40% of her Navy's best air crews and flight technicians. They would never recover these losses. August 1942 would see the first American offensive campaign at the Battle of Guadalcanal. American pilots noticed a new tactic by Japanese pilots. They said, it seemed that Japanese pilots were aiming directly at us and not taking any evasive action. By the end of 1942, the surge of new ships of all sizes and functions in America's Navy would, en would enable further westward advances toward the Japanese homeland. Bunker Hill was but one of these. She's commissioned in May of 1943. She transits the Panama Canal in November of 43. She launches her first strikes against Japan's most powerful base in Rabaul. This was her baptism of fire. At the month's end, Rabaul would be bypassed, leaving 10,000 soldiers isolated for the rest of the war. Other actions would be at Tarawa, Kaviyang, the Gilberts. And as these places are falling, Americans are noting that fewer and fewer people are surrendering, military or civilian. And the casualties, there were 5,000 men killed in Tarawa, 17 surrendered. In Saipan, 27,000 people were killed 250 surrendered. In Saipan, it showed women with babies crawling along the cliff's edge and jumping into the water because they would be told that the barbarians would, were on the, on, the, on the horizon. And so you're seeing more and more, <coughs> you're seeing more and more suicides. Again, we'll go back to the field code of 1941. Never accept alive the shame of capture. Die so as not to leave the disgrace of such an offense. A poem to exhort glory awaiting death in battle. Dying in the advance is the honorable thing. To do, to be shattered like a jewel. A true man would be shattered like a jewel. So that's the mentality that's gaining momentum as the war is going on. This is a picture of a carrier taking just, uh, it was a near miss. But the war, we're, we're getting closer and closer to Japan. Resistance is building up and up and up. Weapons, uh, more and more American forces are present. These are just pictures of what the Bunker Hill is heading into. Here's a, a, a missed hit on a carrier. This is the Franklin. She's a sister ship of the Bunker Hill. They're carbon copies. And here she is. She was hit by a couple kamikazes. And really, it was devastating. One or two planes hitting a carrier like this takes the whole ship out. 
Don't know if you can see it, but here is a kamikaze plane right here. This is on the battleship New Jersey. She's this close, and actually she just, she, she hit the side, but didn't, didn't really do that much damage. But you know, look at the enemy aircraft guns here, 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 here. And they're all, you know, they were, they were, they were like, they were incessant. They would not, once they were making a dive, they would not stop. Huh. This is my wife's uncle, late, late uncle. His name is Alexander DeMoncus. Grew up in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, he went to Yale College of Art. Very, very talented artist. Uh, he, he survived the war, he survived that day. And uh, I had chances to interview him in person. And it was, he was just a, just a wonderful guy. Here's Uncle Al in training. Uh, let's see. It's right, right there, tall guy. The, the, if you were training in the American Air Force or the American Navy, Air, Na, Naval Corps, the training you got was unbelievable. It went on for years and you got trained in everything. You got trained in night flying, navigation, flying in combat formation, takeoff, landing, everything. From the day you start training until the day you're actually commissioned to fly, could be two years of training. Just want to get a picture here. Okay. Here is an aircraft carrier. In the middle is a tanker. And she's being refueled. And over here is a destroyer and she's being refueled. This ability to refuel at sea was brilliant. The ships never had to come into port. This is a letter from Uncle Al. The, uh, the censors would cut out the name of the ship. Okay, So it's <clears throat> Wednesday. Hi, the tanker came and refueled us yesterday, so we got some mail too. I thought that I wrote and said that I left my stuff in San Diego instead of sending it home. We left there on a one-day notice. I thought it best to leave everything. I spent the, sent the hotel money order about three weeks ago. I called them from another city before we shoved off and they said it was okay. Now, Al was an artist. He had done three years at Yale before the war. And he started uh, as a pilot training as a civil air, civil air patrol guy, and one thing led to another. He was also a little bit cynical. He says, uh, hi, got a whole lot of mail to yesterday for a change. When we left Pearl Harbor and headed southwest, it was warm. Then we went north to Tokyo, and it was cold. It was very foggy, too, during our stay. Then we... Then we uh, supported Iwo Jima, then back to Tokyo. Uh, this time there was all snow all around the mountain and then down to Okinawa. That's all up to March 1st. And over here he's got these uh, sketch and this is, says, how do you spell svelte? <laughs> you know. This was the kind of correspondence that uh, uh, papers that you could send uh, brief messages to at home. This is the picture of his quarters. Uh, here's his bunk. Uh, here's a table with food. They have uh, canned peaches, nuts, ashtrays. There's a, a pin up on the wall, a bunk, his uh, flight gear. It's sometimes warm, sometimes cool. I have a chance to do some painting too. Just watercolors, I don't do very much. This is like where I live, Al. This is in the ready room. I mentioned that each pilot had his own seat. Hi, 
Still think they make us get up too early, too often. Hope you're all fine. Tell Ev the, uh, the A's are doing a swell job, baseball news. Bye now, Al. And, and you can see that, uh, you know, there's the storage clipboard for the briefing and everything. Uh, and, and this leads you out and up to the flight deck. If you look at these guys, these are pilots in the, in the ready room. They're not old guys. I mean, they're young. And you see him putting on a, a, an ammunition, a cartridge belt. You know, the parachute gear is hanging. There's a pin up in the wall. But, you know, they're, get, they're getting ready to go on a mission. This is uh, a, a friend of Uncle Al's. This, his name was Avery. Uh, he was uh, uh, in the same squadron as Uncle Al. Uh, Al. Al did this painting of him. He was from uh, New London, Connecticut. Here's a painting that Al did of his squadron attacking Mount Fuji. He was a very, very, we have, we have some of his paintings and uh, he was just, well, okay, confession. Al was a, a very good artist. He was my wife's uncle. The artistic gene goes from Uncle Al to my wife and a couple of her sisters. And then from my wife to my son, Josh, who's very artistic. And if that's not enough, he marries an artist. <laughs> yeah, I'm the only one that can't draw a straight line, even with a ruler. But art is, art is always it's pretty present. OK, kamikazes. How do you convince a perfectly health, health, healthy guy to get in an airplane with only enough gas to make it one way and tell them, don't land, just crash into a ship. I mean, it's the whole mindset. And <clears throat> it, it was a reflection of Japanese society, which I, ha I never realized how dominant, how uh, controlling, how ultimate the emperor was to Japanese society. Everything hinged on what would the emperor do. And the society, particularly in the early 30s, right up to the war, was becoming more and more militaristic, more and more resentful of outsiders controlling the raw materials and countries within their sphere of influence. So it boiled down to they treated the emperor like God. And if God's on your side, then you've got to be right. It was just, it was just very, the press, the media, everything. Everything was controlled by the emperor. Here is the emperor. This is the, uh, that was a very, very popular plane. It's a Japanese Zero. Another picture of it. Fast, maneuverable. And here's a picture just before she hits a ship. This guy is Kayoshi Ogawa. He's a future kamikaze pilot. He's born in a small farming community in 1929, one of five kids. His life is simple, school, work on the farm. He's raised in a militaristic society with complete reverence and obedience to the emperor. The emperor exercises his authority via a constitutional government controlled by the military. The Japanese view the emperor as a god, hence fighting for the emperor was the same as fighting for God. He graduates from high school in 1941. He enrolls in university in 1942. He and his fellow students live in a world that stressed complete adherence, dedication, and loyalty to a commitment of super patriotism, which demands total obedience to family and country. Students, college students, as well as the vast majority of citizens are isolated from the details of politics and global matters. By the fall of 1943, Japan's experiencing numerous challenges. Casualties are increasing. Her forces are overextended. She needs more recruits. 
In particular, she needs more pilots. On October the 21st, Imperial Order number 755 is issued by the Emperor. This eliminates the temporary exemption for liberal arts students from, from being drafted. Effective that day, 65,000 students are drafted. At a gathering proclaiming this act, thousands of them march in the rain to the Imperial Palace and they raise three banzai cheers for the emperor. Ozawa is now in the Imperial Japanese Navy. He's a common seaman. He's subject to hazings and beatings and sadistic behavior by his instructors. He survives and he's promoted to ensign and he's assigned to a kamikaze special attack unit. Now all of these men are volunteers. They all have to complete a three-part survey. Part number one, do you wish? Part number two, do you earnestly wish? Part number three, do not wish to be a member of the Kamikaze Corps? Uh, a couple said no, but it didn't make any difference. His training, and, and the kamikazes were, uh, th that branch of the, them was called TOKO, T-O-K-K-O, and the training was minimal. Only TOKO pilots worthy of fuel consumption qualified. They did not learn combat flying. They taxied out, they circled, and landed over and over but no more than a half an hour flight per day. They had two days practicing formation flying. The last three days were focused on approaching and striking a target. The average kamikaze had less than two days practicing to take off and he had difficulty flying in bad weather and formation. They're headed to the, uh, the, the next scene of at duty for these kamikazes is Okinawa. These are all potential kamikaze pilots. I mean, if you look at them, they're proud, happy, ready to engage. The first kamikaze, the first one was named Kamikaze Special Attack Corps, Toko. It's created by this guy, Admiral Onishi, on October 1944. He was ruthless. He was a samurai in the traditional sense of the old traditions, and he was a talented calligra calligrapher. To inspire the, inspire the members of his group, he wrote, the wild cherry blossom falls without regret as it scatters its perfume in the light of the rising sun. He's addressing 27 pilots. He speaks of the planes armed with a 250 kilogram bomb, which were to crash dive into an enemy aircraft. At the end of his briefing, he asks of the pilot, if you're gonna die anyway, it is good to make maximum effect on the enemy, maximum effect of your life. What do you think? All the pirates agree. Only she refers to these pilots. He says, you are already gods without earthly desires. He wrote, in blossom today, then scattered, life is so like a delicate flower. How can one expect the fragrance to last forever? Here's a picture of the flight deck of the Bunker Hill. Uh, they had, the, the, they had a, uh, on the tails, they had uh, an, an arrow pointing upward. That was their symbol. The planes are all aft because when you launch a plane, you want the full use or as much of the use of the flight deck as a runway. 
So they're in a convoy here. Okinawa. Basically, Okinawa was the last step towards Japan. Once you pass Okinawa, next stop is, is Japan. And the, the resistance there was horrific. It was an island, and it was uh, surrounded these squares here. Each represent a ship, an American ship, that was on picket duty to alert the task force down further of the oncoming uh, kamikazes. 88 American destroyers were damaged or sunk in this campaign. The Japanese thought if they knock out these destroyers, then the American radar will be stifled and the transport and the carriers won't know we're coming. And here's a list of them. It just tells the ship casualties, killed and wounded, such and such a ship killed, the cap, including the captain. So there were horrific losses. At Okinawa, the Navy had more casualties than the Marines, more than the uh, Army, because of so many ships were hit by kamikazes. All right, <clears throat> here's a sketch. So here's the, the flight deck on the top. Here's the gallery deck, and that, 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 it's just a thin line, but that's how close it was to the deck. And then they have a fire curtain here, a fire curtain here. The planes are all below on the hangar deck. And then this is the crew's quarters, the mess area, storage, engine room. At approximately 2 a.m. May 11th, 1945, Admiral Yugaki's scout planes discover the Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill goes to general quarters at once, but by mid-morning, a status of condition able allows a break for some of the men. The previous day, Bunker Hill was resupplied with 90% of her fuel capacity. She now holds 1,873,000 gallons of ship's fuel and about 250,000 gallons of aviation gas. At about 9.45 in the morning, the aft flight deck is filled with fresh planes stacked wing to wing fully loaded with fuel, shells, and bombs, rockets, and napalm. Below, on the hangar deck, are another 48 planes waiting to be brought up. They're low on fuel, they're waiting for permission, no, they're, they're waiting to be brought up. In the air, returning from an earlier mission, are about 20 aircraft. They're waiting for permission to land. Also, among the airborne planes are members of the Combat Air Patrol at approximately 1,500 feet. And they're just kind of circling to be an extra pair of eyes to make sure nobody gets through. At 10.02 in the morning, Jim Sweat, he's a pilot, he observes two kamikazes diving out of the clouds at six or 7,000 feet, headed directly towards the Bunker Hill. He radios, Viceroy Base, there's two kamikazes diving on you. Within 10 or 15 seconds, the first kamikaze releases its bomb. This plane was piloted by Yasunori Seizio, firing his guns as he strafed the flight deck filled with aircraft. Upon his release, a 550-pound bomb tumbles ahead of the plane, blows through the flight deck, just aft of number three elevator, tears through the, uh, it rips apart a passageway in the gallery deck, and then through the hangar deck ceiling, and it blows a hole on the outside of the ship. 
Gunners manning guns on the port side are torn apart. Yazanuri's plane crashed. Planes on the aft section, within 30 seconds, most of the aft section is ablaze. His plane cut through aircraft on deck whose propellers were already spinning, ripping open their fuel tanks, setting fires, blazing, and throwing shrapnel in all directions. 1,500 feet above in his plane, Jim Sweat observes this chaos. He just cleaned house. God, it was a terrible mess. In a second kamikaze, Kayoshi Ogawa radios his base at 9.58 a.m. I found the enemy vessels. Then, I see an enemy plane. In his final message, at 10.02, 30 seconds, his last words were, now I am nosediving into the ship. His plane was spotted by the Franklin gunners, who with other ships were firing at his plane. They hit him several times, but it didn't slow down the zero. Aiming for the ship's island and the smoke and fire, Ogawa released his 500-pound bomb at precisely the right moment. It fell just ahead of his plane, exploded instantly, crashing through the flight deck. Plane hit the side of the island, ripping away some of the catwalk and missed killing Admirals Mitcher and Arleigh Burke by less than 20 feet. Fires burned everywhere. The gallery deck disappeared. The machinery for the 16,000 pound deck edge elevator was melted, twisted, and broken. Munitions heated and exploded. Fires blocked the catwalk. Smoke and poisoned air filled the areas, cutting off visibility to the exits. In spite of the damage and confusion, Within moments of Ogawa's crash, crew members started to fight the fires, to tend the wounded, to gather the dead, and implement damage control steps. In the water, destroyers were picking up men who had either been blown overboard or simply jumped to avoid the fire. Alongside of the ship was the cruiser Wilkes-Barre, trying to put out the fires and assist in the transfer of the wounded. Here's all of the damage was on the last half of the ship, but you can see the fires are almost up to the island. I mean, this is horrendous damage. This is uh, the, the exact moment that the uh, second plane hit, and there's a little light right there, a little explosion, and that's, that's when it happened. <laughs> Again, if you could make it to the uh, bow, you'd be okay, but aft, everything is carnage. This is, uh, this is the cruise at Wilkes-Barre, and she's helping to put out fires. And see how close she is to, to the carrier. This is the side of the ship. Nobody survived. All of these guns are empty. Water's pouring out. From the, from the fire. Uh, in the hanging deck, you can see some men trying to gather the wounded. Again, the Wilkes-Barre. Look at the size compared to the carrier. I mean, these are huge vessels. Uh, this man's being transferred from the carrier to the cruiser, and uh, I'm not 100% certain, but I think he, I, I think I know who he is. Uh, the gentleman was, he actually was from the Boston area, worked at uh, New England, uh, New England uh, Baptist Hospital for a number of years. He survived the war, putting out the fire. This is a hole from one of the bombs. Uh, let's see. <coughs> in the boiler rooms, <coughs> excuse me, 
In the boiler rooms, men were having difficulty breathing. The toxic air which seared their lungs, burned their throats, and scratched their eyes. Soon, carbon monoxide appears and causes the men to tire and to want to go to sleep. Normally, the ambient temperature was 110 degrees. The last report out of the engine room was 139 degrees. They had to keep the boilers and the engines running to keep the ship afloat. The, the men knew it, and they never abandoned their duty station. Engineering group would have the highest casualties of any group. Out of a total of 530 men, 100 were lost and 37 were wounded. <coughs> Sacrifices. Well, after both kamikazes had crashed, men throughout the ship were dying. Some were victims of fire, exploding ordnance, toxic air, or trapped behind sealed watertight doors, or forced to jump from great heights into the water. They faced these threats in different ways. There was a Marine captain of a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft anti gun, severely wounded in his lower, lower stomach, and they tried to staunch the bleeding with towels and shirts, but to no avail. He ordered one of his men, he ordered his men to keep firing and told one of them, get me an American flag. He died holding the flag to his chest. In the boiler rooms, Commander Joseph Carmichael's men were ordered to keep the boilers running at all costs. They were ordered not to leave their posts. In essence, this was a death sentence, essential to saving the ship. There was a case of men pounding and screaming by a secured watertight door. A request was made by an office, to an officer to open the door. Denied, do not open the door. On the flight deck, men were trying to rescue pilots below in the ready room. And this particular scene here. So below this area in the gallery, they thought that there were some pilots that were still alive. And they had a lumberjack and he cut a hole through the deck. A chief petty officer ordered Jerry Hansen to be lowered into the black hole, reeking of horrible odors of fuel, gasoline, burned rubber, and the stench of burned flesh. He's being lowered head first, further and further into this hole with minimal light. He suddenly looks at a blurred jumble, and then he realized it was a tangle of dead men. They died in blackness and confusion. He screamed, get me out of here. All these people are dead. Later, Hansen said, it was like, how would you imagine uh, hell would be, I guess. Uh, let's see here. This is just scenes of carnage below decks. Anybody in this area here did not survive. Here are the dead being gathered and the, some wounded. I asked Uncle Al, I said, so how did you, how did you survive? What'd you do? He says, well, I just landed. Uh, I took some reconnaissance pictures of Okinawa. I just landed and I wanted to go to the ready room and have coffee with my buddies, but I thought, ah, I've got to get these pictures developed. So instead of going left out of the passageway, he went right. And he said he walked about 25 feet and he said he heard a huge bang. And he turned around and he said everything was black except a huge ball of fame racing, a pile racing towards him. And he got topside and he headed toward the, uh, toward the bow. And he's trying to help some of the wounded. And he came across this one fellow. He said, I, I knew he was young, but his face was horribly burnt. And I said, what, what can I do to help you? And he said, the kid said, can you light me a cigarette? And Al said, I never smoked again after that. 
On May 12th, at 12.03, Saturday, Captain Sice orders the flag to be brought to half-staff for the burial of 352 officers, crew, airmen, and the Admiral's staff. Service would last until sunset and be the largest burial at sea in the U.S. Navy's history. Prior to burial, each body was placed on a sheet of navy blue canvas with two 55-pound, five-inch shells positioned to weight the body and the canvas folded over the body. The body was then tied securely with 40-foot lengths of cordage with a half hitch every 18 inches, securing the body within its shroud. Six burials were done at a time. The ship's carpenter made wooden boxes to send home the personal effects of men lost in combat. Honor guards draped an American flag over each body. A priest, minister, and rabbi presided at each burial. If the deceased was unknown, all three would speak. By the end of the day, these chaplains could hardly utter the prayers required. I had access to a diary from Uncle Al's mother, Grandmother Ethel. And she said, I'm going to keep a diary of the events of the war. And she started it <coughs> in July of 1942. Uh, and here it is. This is the last page of her diary. Uh, July 9th. Al brought Phyllis Dyer in from New York to spend three days. Very nice girl. They, Alex and I, went to LaGuardia to see Al off for Los Alamos, Alamodos, California. Plane left at 9 o'clock. August 14th. War ends. 7 p.m. September 15th. As Al's mail is being returned, he must be on his way home, September 22nd. Al came home at 7 p.m. tonight. He has a wonderful war record and returns in fine health. Thank God for all of this. And that concludes my talk on the Bunker Hill. <clears throat> <clears throat> I, b I bounce around a lot, but ah, I, oh God, I'm stiff. <laughs> Who said it was fun getting old? Oh my gosh. Anyway, I'd be glad to field any questions. Ma'am. Can you tell me the difference between the, the, the war planes? You said there was a bomb, the dive bombers and the torpedo bombers. Yeah. What's, what was the difference between them? The torpedo bomb, yeah. Is it okay if I sit? Of course, yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. My grandkids keep notes on me. <laughs> Oh boy. So a dive bomber basically would have a bomb and his approach would be he'd be up there and he would spot the target and then he would dive almost straight down to the point where he was as close as he could possibly be. He'd release the bomb and then he'd shoot upright. Torpedo bombers, torpedo bombers were their torpedo had to hit the water. So they would approach the target 10 feet above the water, 15 feet above the water, but they would go straight and they would be at the same height of the ship. And, but they were slower, they were much slower. And of course, coming in like that, it was, it was uh, they took a lot of casualties, particularly at the Battle of Midway. There was a squadron of, I think, 20, 22, of, uh, 22 torpedo bombers, and uh, I think one survived or two survived. But as the war got, you know, better, things got better. Somebody else? With the, um, the ships, the battleships, uh, did the planes, was the ship going this way and the planes would take off into the way? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, there would, yeah. 
Yeah, they would, they would rip them up and everything. And what made, what made the uh, losses and the destruction so large was you had everybody full of bombs, fuel, ammunition, napalm, just waiting to take off. And so when they hit it, I mean, so I, I, I want to get a casualty list to find out, you know, the, you, you can find out the, if you, uh, the, where the individual was from if he was killed in action. But it's, you know, it's a pretty lengthy search. Uncle Al survived. Uh, after the war, I'm sure some of you guys will remember this. If you were like in the 60s, you would look at a magazine and you'd see a sketch of a pony or a dog or a horse and it would say, if you can draw me, you can be an artist. So he was one of the founders of that. I mean, he was, he was really riding the wave. And he was running the uh, Monaco branch in Europe. He and his wife and the kids, they're living high off the hog. And I had just met my wife in, in Boston. And uh, she invited, uh, they, Uncle Al invited Mary to go spend a month in Monaco. And she goes, uh, I don't know, I just met this guy in Boston and he just got out of the army. <laughs> she said, the dumbest move she's ever made. <laughs> But he went on to become uh, very active in the famous artist correspondence school. And uh, he came home from an annual meeting and found out that some of the partners were cooking the books. And it was like, wow. But he, you know, he continued. Okay, you said that they um, used napalm. Yeah. Did they spread it as a air gas or? How did they? A napalm? The, the napalm? Well, they were bombs, but they would have like they would have dropped them. Yeah, yeah. It was. Uh, it wasn't like Vietnam. Right. Yeah. No, it was. It was. Uh, you'd have. They were like rockets full of napalm. Uh, so Uncle, anyway, I, I interviewed interviewed him a number of times, and uh, he was just a good guy, and we, you know, but he was a good artist. You know, and I, I grew up in Maine. I, I, I never knew anybody. Art did not apply to the worst in Maine. Okay, it was like, yeah, well, someday somebody might, but it was, it was, uh, it was not a leafy suburb. But I was so intrigued when I met Mary and I saw how she could paint and draw, and I go, oh, gosh, you know, it was, it's, it's still good, it's still excellent. Uh, it took the, 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 the attack took the Bunker Hill out. She never was in combat again. Uh, the Navy kind of glibly announced that, yeah, well, a lot of the carriers were hit and taken out of action, but we never lost one of them, you know. But be that as it may. Uh, yeah, I, I, I like telling this story only because of the fact that that was uh, 1945, so that's 55, 75, eight, some like 80 odd years ago. That's ancient history to today's college or high school kid. Absolutely no clue, you know? Uh, did, did the invasion include only the aircraft carriers and their protective fleet, or were there some battleships with their protective fleet? Yeah, there, there were battleships. Uh, the, 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 uh, the invasion fleet for Okinawa was one of the largest fleets ever assembled. I mean, over, there were, I mean you had 185,000 Marines. Uh, you had army, army troops there. And then just all the other ships. It was, uh, it was Okinawa. You know? But after that, then he started hitting Japan. And in November of, uh, yeah, I think it was, well, not sure, but following Okinawa, the next stop was Japan and B-29s. B-29s were dropping bombs in Tokyo and all over. The biggest fire in the history of the world was caused by B-29s dropping incendiaries. Because in Japan, everything was built out of wood. Any more, ma'am? Um, was the Bunker Hill brought back to uh, Pearl Harbor? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. She made it back to Ulithi and then ultimately back to, I think, Bremerton and Washington. But her war career was over. Was she was scrapped then? I think they repaired her to a, to a degree, but yeah, and by then the war was over anyway, and we, you know, what are you going to do with all these ships and carriers, so. Would they have brought back the whole crew with it, or would they have been dispersed to other carriers or ships? Uh, actually, that's a, a good question. On the Bunker Hill, they buried all of the dead that day, and the wounded were cared for on hospital ships. On the Franklin, which was hit earlier, that was hit in March, they brought the Franklin home with all the dead still on board the ship, and that was not the way to go. All right? Are there, I can't see the donuts. <laughs> Sir. Was, was there ever another aircraft carrier called Bunker Hill? Good question. There is not another aircraft carrier Bunker Hill, but there is a large state-of-the-art guided missile cruiser named after the Bunker Hill. And uh, she's maybe two years old, a beautiful ship. And so I gave this talk at some library, a library in Connecticut, and I said, you got everything you need? And they said, yep. And they, I said, you got a picture? No, we're okay. So I go, all right. So I, when I get to give the talk, I'm looking at a picture of the Bunker Hill, and it's the new one. It was the wrong <laughs> ship, you know? And somebody goes, well, that's the wrong ship. And I go, well, yeah. Ma'am. Um, you, you talked about, you asked the question, how did people talk these young kamikaze yeah. pilots yeah. into doing this? I, I had a professor at Harvard who had been a psychologist during the Korean War, and I think he worked for the I think he worked for the Army then. Yeah, okay. And he shared with me that his job was to talk to soldiers who didn't want to kill when they were mm -hmm. facing people. Yeah. And his job was to talk them in. Yeah, he was counter counter trend. Yeah. Yeah. So my last comment. I gave, well, it doesn't have any bearing on this, but it does deal with a Japanese officer. I gave a talk. It, I got a couple of minutes? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'll wrap it up. But I gave a talk at, uh, in, in Wellesley, and it showed, you know, how I talk about in the first six months of the war, we lost the Philippines, we lost Singapore, we lost Malaya, we lost Guam. And so I showed, I showed this one slide, and it show, it's an iconic picture, and it shows two Japanese officers and two British officers, and the British officers have the uh, Union Jack on, on their flagpoles, and they're marching to surrender Singapore. And Singapore, that was a colossal failure of the British military. That was never supposed to happen. So I show that picture, and then we're going to go to the Philippines, and the, the, this guy stands up and the lights are out and he says, hey, can I see that picture again? And I go, this one? He goes, no, the other one, the one with the two Japanese guys and the two British guys. So I go back to the picture and he's, he's elderly uh, and he's Asian and he's squinting and he's looking and he goes, yeah, yeah, that's him. <laughs> and I go, who? He says, the Japanese guy on the right, that's my brother-in-law. And I go, that's your brother-in-law? And he says, yeah, he was, the, he was the interpreter of the Japanese surrender. And so at first I thought, well, you know, we get old, our minds get a little dim. But I, I came to know him, and yeah, it was, it was all legitimate. So you never know who's in the audience. All right. Thank you. I just want to thank you again, but I also wanted people to know that there are materials along the table. Oh, yeah, go look. Table, yeah. But also that we run over, so I want people to go that want to go. Like, you're oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ah.